How are you? Good. I'm Sarah Posner, and I'm talking today with Matthew Schmitz. He's the deputy editor at First Things Magazine. And we're going to be talking about Pope Francis and his influence on Catholicism around the world, but particularly in the United States, and what his uh, tenure as Pope so far uh, has meant for American Catholics. Uh, and we're talking on Friday, the day after the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops concluded its big meeting in Baltimore, where they elected a new president of the Bishops' Conference, um, Archbishop Kurtz of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and I wanted to talk um, first about an article that appeared in the New York Times a few days before this big meeting convened. And the article uh, talked about conservative Catholics feeling left out and angry um, by the changes that Francis was bringing, in particular, the emphasis on pastoral care and caring for the weak and vulnerable over uh, political considerations. Uh, and that article, which was written by the great religion reporter, Lori Goodstein, um, uh, interviewed some uh, Catholics, I think, in Georgia. Uh, and this one uh, woman uh, was talking about how she felt she she had a little, I think, refrigerator magnet or something of the Pope that she felt so angry about <laughs> it that she threw it away <laughs> or a little card <laughs> that she kept on her refrigerator. And um, I was actually a little surprised by that. I mean, I don't doubt that there are some people out there who might feel that way or or... I, I do think that there are some Catholics, I know in some of the reporting that I've done, I've encountered people who felt a little bit like his, the inter, the big interview that he did was um, where he talked about, you know, we shouldn't be, or there's been this obsessiveness with the abortion and same-sex marriage issue, um, that they felt a little insulted by that, that the things that they felt that they had worked really hard on, that the church, they, they thought the church wanted them to work on, that the that the Pope was now dismissing those things. Um, but I think the pictures may be a little bit more complicated than that. What do you think? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, I, th I thought that the, uh, the report in the New York Times you know, kind of failed to deliver the goods in terms of more prominent Catholic voices expressing the kinds of sentiments um, you know, that, that good scene uh, you know, was trying to document. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I guess one, one place to look uh, for this kind of confusion that resulted especially from Francis's uh, comment about not being obsessed. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet Smith published an article with First Things called Are We Obsessed? And Janet Smith is a uh, strong uh, advocate for you know the rights of the unborn, uh, the infirm, uh, the elderly. Um, and so she had this kind of soul searching piece, you know, asking, you know, if you know, you know, in what's in what sense does he mean, uh, you know, what does he mean by obsession? Has she been guilty of obsession? And so I think that that has raised some questions, and there's been confusion there. Um, but I've I've been pretty impressed, uh, actually, by seeing how you know even sort of so-called conservative Catholics, and I you know people always say you know these labels aren't final, but I think there's probably something to them. Um, and, and I myself am a conservative Catholic, right? Uh, to to whatever extent you know those terms, uh, you know, are, are worthwhile. Um, but, uh, I've, I've been really impressed at how many sort of Catholics are trying to take the Pope's words to heart and, and really ask, well, you know, what, what does he mean here? I mean, you know, his off the cuff remarks aren't infallible, but there's a certain, you know, you know, we can expect, it's like if your father, if your father says something exactly like that, it's exactly like that Pope, you know, Papa, father, so if your father says something, it may not be infallible, but you know it's certainly right to kind of respectfully consider and say, well, he's wiser than me, he's older than me. You know, what what what, what does he have to teach me here? And especially when it's this kind of spiritual authority that the Pope has. Right. Well, um, well I mean, what do you think he meant when he made that comment, the obsessed comment? I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, what was so striking was that I think it was the next day or the day after he delivered, you know, like a, just a really full-throated uh, condemnation of uh, kind of the culture, I think, of 
so you know kind of the culture of uh, you know discardability or something you know but well how, he was speaking to a group of Catholic gynecologists I think when he made those comments right right the comments you're talking about mm-hmm. yeah so I, I can't remember the exact terms he used but it was, it was very you know kind of strong combination of abortion along with other social ills um, and uh, so I, I but I, I think above all um, you know I've, I was trying to I was thinking about this you know I've been reading various Catholic voices you know Mm-hmm. Ross Southett, my colleague, uh, Russ Reno, the editor of First Things, uh, and George Weigel. And, you know, I went back and read the uh, Apostolic Nuncio to the uh, uh, to the United States, the Pope's man in D.C., before the USCCB met, delivered a speech, you know, talking about uh, Pope Paul VI's kind of vision of a pastoral church and the kind of pastoral mission of the Second Vatican Council. And... He called on on the bishops as they entered their meeting this past week to be not an ideological, but a, but you know, kind of pastoral. Um, so I, I see this as kind of connected to Pope Francis's obsessed remark. And Pagano, this uh, nuncio, said that this mm-hmm. idea, you know, being pastoral over being ideological, was an idea he had, you know, got from Pope Francis, who, when he met with Pagano, said, "Please tell the American bishops, yeah, I want, I want." them to be pastoral, not ideological. So what does he mean here? Right. And, you know, and so one possible answer would be to say, well, he doesn't mean anything and just wave away his remarks. You know, I I think that he he has a point. Um, Another possible answer would be to say, well, the bishops have been ideological, and so they need to kind of change their ideology. Um, You know, Pope Francis isn't, doesn't really seem to be proposing any, Change certainly. I mean, not just in the deposit of the faith, but even going beyond the kind of you know base Catholic orthodoxy. I don't think he's. I mean, he's obviously not a kind of traditionalist, uh, you know, Latin Mass Catholic. Right. And he's not. He's not much of a strong progressive Catholic either. I think that certainly his rhetoric is more in that vein than Benedict's. Uh, you know, and John Paul II's was. Right. Right. But but he's not. That strong of one. So I see him as basically a kind of you know, Vatican II Catholic, you know, kind of re- reading Vatican II through the hermeneutic of continuity proposed by Benedict uh, as a sort, you know, Benedict working in conjunction with John Paul II. So to get back to my point, you know, what, what does this mean, uh, you know, pastoral, not ideological? I'd say it's not so much a shift in ideology, but a shift in focus. And in this address, which I really recommend that the uh, nuncio gave to the American bishops, he said, you know, in, in the modern age, and he uh, he was quoting, I, I think, um, I think it was Paul VI. He said, you know, in the modern age, um, men don't listen to teaching so much as they listen they listen to a visible witness. And so, if you bishops, you know, you can teach as much as you want, but if you aren't modeling a Christian life, kind of humility, um, openness, poverty, uh, no one's going to listen. And so. You know, I, th- I think I think above all, you know, that this council is not so much you know should we focus more on abortion, less on abortion. Um, those questions might need to be you know those questions might be at play. I'm not entirely sure, and I don't think mm-hmm. the statements have been altogether clear. But above all, it's more about how the bishop acts toward his flock, how he acts toward the world. And I think you know we've seen Pope Francis do that. And you know, what's imp- so impressive is not so much you know his words in various interviews. You know, it's these you know, physical you know, actions he's performed right. that have just electrified everyone, you know, mm-hmm. paying for his hotel bill, you know, kissing a disfigured man, um, all, all these things that have seemed to speak so powerfully. And so, you know, Vatican II is sometimes called not so much a teaching council as a pastoral council, not something proposing new, it, you know, less than... Uh, other councils that have proposed new teachings. It, it more proposed a kind of new pastoral stance. Well, it, it, um, it, right, exactly. I mean, it, it engaged the, the lay people more in what was going on at mass, right? I mean, that was part of, part of what that was about. And also part of what Francis criticized, I think it was in the La Republica interview when he, he did make a sort of, um, uh, critical comment about uh, 
the Latin mass. Uh, and, and I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but he said that it, it had become very ideological. I think that was the word that he used. But I don't think that the, um, you know, it's not mutually exclusive, right, for a bishop or a priest to tend to his flock and be engaged in these politicized issues also. I mean, it's not like, so I, I guess I think that, you know, on the liberal side, people have overread Francis's comments to suggest that he wants or to suggest that perhaps the bishops, the U.S. bishops in listening to him will pull back from these issues that they've been so engaged in in the political sphere. But if you think about it and, you know, I'm not Catholic, so correct me if I'm misreading any of this, but if you look at what Francis is saying, I don't think that, I don't think he's saying that these things are mutually exclusive. I think he's just saying, look, maybe you've, you've pulled away a little bit from these pastoral uh, requirements. And it may not be because a bishop is too entwined in some of these political issues. It could be because, I don't know, you know, he, he became too comfortable in his position or, you know, these are other things that, that Francis talks about. Um, so, you know, I don't, I think that, I do think that there are liberal folks who are overreading what he's saying on the, on these political things. Right. I mean, there's a kind of, um, you know, in the kind of age of mass media, uh, more so than previously, you know, the, anything the Pope says is kind of read through the lens of, you know, kind of the conventions of democratic politics. So, you know, or, you have, or if any bishop, it's kind of like, well, you know, is the church sort of changing positions or, um, you know, how will this new leader affect things? Um, and, you know, the church comes to be viewed as a political body or even a political lobby within the larger uh, sphere. I remember reading at one point um, the, uh, you know, it was maybe like NARAL Pro-Choice America or someone, or maybe it was the Human Rights Campaign, and uh, they had issued this flyer saying, or, you know, press release talking about, like, anti, like the anti-women's choice group, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, or maybe it was, like, the anti-gay rights group, Roman Catholic Church, and just thinking, like, whoa, I mean, you know, there, there, there are real political disagreements there. Um, but to, you know, to describe the Catholic Church, which is this institution with, you know, about a couple thousand years history, kind of, if you define institution sort of loosely, um, and has a lot of different concerns to, to you know, define it exclusively as an anti this group kind of shows how it's being you know, massively misread, maybe not by the most charitable interpreters, but well, I think ma that, maybe they have some kind of point. Um, well, I think part of that stems from how the USCCB and in particular yeah. its presence in Washington and its president pres presence on Capitol Hill and the fact that it does have lobbyists and it does do this work on Capitol Hill. Um, and, for example, after it established the Ad Hoc Committee on Religious Freedom, the, I can't remember the formal name of it, but the, the committee that um, Archbishop Laurie heads, you know, so this was for, for Americans who are, not, um, who are not Catholic or who may be Catholic but are not mass-attending Catholics, you know, this is the face of the church that they see, right? So they see in the news that the bishops are opposed to the contraception coverage in the Affordable Care Act. They see in the news that the bishops are opposed to um, uh, different provisions of the Affordable Care Act. They're opposed to same-sex marriage. They're opposed to gay adoption. So this is what they see. And I always think that what Francis was reacting to was not so much a criticism, perhaps not a criticism of the bishops themselves, but an effort to try to recast how the public sees them. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, Christ's ministry was, you know, read uh, in, you know, through a political lens by, uh, by his opponents and by, you know, certain members of the political cast, uh, class. And, uh, you know, bishops down through the centuries have, um, you know, engaged in political struggles and been very belligerent, um, you know, in confronting secular authorities. And often that's been very helpful, and that's, you know, the reason we have, um, 
kind of notion of the independence of the church, you know, to the extent that we have it today, it's because of the these uh, fights bishops you know, waged down through the centuries with uh, you know, Roman emperors and uh, other secular rulers. So, yeah, I mean, things are always going to be read politically, but, uh, you know, it's certainly helpful if, you know, part, part of the Episcopal function as a shepherd surely should be trying to show people, you know, where the church's heart lies. And it's not in kind of just kind of confronting or challenging a certain political uh, regime, or not not only that, but, uh, you know, also comforting the sick, uh, you know, clothing the naked, these things. So, but how does the church accomplish this in terms of its public image? I mean, of course, you know, I mean, I, ideally, I would imagine a church is not concerned with public relations, but I do think that the Catholic church is concerned with public relations and, and it's not the only religious uh, institution that is. I'm not singling it out for that. Um, it's inevitable in this age that they are concerned with public relations. But at the same time, I mean, I think that, you know, humility requires that, you know, you just do these things and don't, you know, issue a press release that you just help these, you know, did this, um, did this good works for the poor or did this thing for this vulnerable population? I mean, that's just what you do. You don't publicize it. So what's the challenge for the church here when it does so vigorously publicize the political things that it's doing that have set people off and been critical of its political activity? How does it, how does it counterbalance that in a way that's not kind of, you know, is, you know, patting itself on the back? Right. Yeah, well, if I mean, if the Christian faith is true, there will be an internal logic um, apparent to the church's acts. And so as much as it confounds or confuses people over time, you know, at least a few people, or at least a few moments, like a, a deeper a deeper truth will shine forth that, you know, connects acts of mercy and acts of resistance to injustice. And um, then if the church... You know, the church ultimately has to kind of have its own culture and shape and, and shape culture. You know, it's typical of any civilization that there's a you know, you know a faith, a cultural, a, a faith, a cult, a right that lies at the center of it. And the church has to, you know, first form form that culture within itself, and then um, you know by you know by so first the church has to try to be authentically Catholic in the term in terms of. Um, you know, not just sort of um, saying, well, this is the Catholic take on this pop cultural item, but saying, well, what really is Catholic culture? And ultimately, Catholic culture is, uh, you know, mass, the sacraments, um, the prayers of the church, you know, catechesis, the different vocations that have been given to the church, you know, priestly life, religious life. And so the, the church, you can see how it has, you know, and uh, even in post-Christian culture, the, in a post-Christian culture, the Christian church can still try to be a Christian culture. To too large an extent, the church is itself a post-Christian culture. But what do you mean by a post-Christian culture? Where Christianity no longer lies at the heart of things. It's no longer like our, just kind of our, you know, daily rhythms of life, our horizon of thought is no longer formed by the Catholic faith in the way that once was. One, one can still be Catholic, um, you know, in this world, and you know, with with great comfort and ease, even uh, in certain places, um, but the culture itself isn't isn't Catholic. There's you know, it's more of a kind of you know secular kind of humanistic or um, you know, kind of liberal culture with you know certain Christian leanings or inheritances. Well, I mean, do you think that in the United States we've ever had the the culture that you describe? But the United States was uh, was a Protestant culture. Uh, I think that's pretty pretty clear that uh, you know, there's a strong. It wasn't you know there there wasn't an establishment of church, but uh, there right. were prayers, you know, Bible readings in classrooms, kind of designed. Uh, and so you know, Protestant was defined against Catholic. You know, there's a separate Catholic school system. Uh, Blaine amendments passed against public funding of Catholic schools. Uh, religious curricula in schools designed to kind of um, exclude Catholics, you know, like a 
you know, programs of Bible readings and of prayers that Catholics weren't comfortable with. And other non-Protestants. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, I, I think a lot of Catholics, you know, because they were the most relevant right. group. And uh, uh, so, yeah, America had a de facto kind of implicit kind of soft Protestant consensus that, um, you know, and obviously there were, you know, the know-nothings and uh, things like that. But for the most part, I mean, it's has to be applauded as an admirably you know, toler tolerant, um, capacious, uh, you know, thing that was built. So, so uh, when do you think the, in other parts of the world where Catholicism was more, um, dominant, what do you think was the, I mean, was it the enlightenment that led to the post-Christian culture? Was it some other, uh, historical phenomena? Yeah, I can say I'm entirely sure what the, uh, what the genealogy, uh, is, is there. Um, you know, Christianity seems to have this weird way of, uh, hollowing itself out. I think it's a, a scholar, Robert Wilkin, who once, uh, described Christianity as, uh, kind of like a prairie fire that burns up everything in its path in this great blaze of faith. Um, but then it kind of moves on and there are only sort of embers, uh, or char left in its wake. Whereas, um, in this one passage, he contrasts that with Islam, where Islam is like a kind of, it's like a expanding sea that covers more and more territory, but there's a kind of stability there and it kind of, uh, holds its gains in a way Christianity doesn't seem to. I mean, these, the, you know, Muslim majority world, uh, consists primarily of, you know, what were once Christian lands, you know, you can kind of draw and then, you know, sort of post-Christian lands in a way that there aren't really post-Muslim lands. Um, you know, not that the Muslim world is a sort of unanimous. No, not at all. <laughs> kind of sea of, de of devotion <laughs> right. or, or anything like so singular. But I mean, we, we see a kind of, um, you know, secularity and disengagement from faith. And the West, so, I, I think. I think that there's probably a distinction between Islam and Christianity without um, over stressing how Muslim, you know, kind of Muslim majority countries are. So. Well, we've digressed kind of a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about the um, Archbishop Kurtz, uh, who was just elected president of the U.S. Bishops right. Conference, um, and he was. Um, he was the, I, I think they called it the executive vice president of the Bishops' Conference, and the customary thing is to just elevate that person, which was not done the last time when Cardinal Dolan was was uh, made president of the of the USCCB. Um, so in a way, this sort of seemed like, well, you know, we're going back to that way of just like elevating the next guy in line. Um, and um, but do you think that there was more to it than that? That do you think that Kurtz was seen as a figure? who would um, carry out this vision uh, that Pope Francis has been laying out. Yeah, I, I don't know how much more uh, to it than the kind of simple elevation there was. You know, I have read some of his statements afterward, and it sort of, it, it's impressed me. I think, you know, just from what little I've read of Kurtz in his uh, recent interviews, he gave an interview to, with to um, Adi Mena of the uh, Catholic News Agency, and, you know, in it, he told her that, uh, you know, he's, you know, there's, there's no question of kind of backing away from the church's sort of witness to, uh, you know, the dignity of the unborn, uh, the church's um, kind of vocal protests of the HHS mandate. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the same time, they're heeding Francis's call to be pastoral. So uh, it seems to me that he has what seems like a very sober uh, reading of Pope Francis that doesn't, you know, kind of either dismiss him or, you know, wildly misread him. But instead, it seems he's, he's trying to, you know, as a, as a brother bishop of Francis's, take what the Bishop of Rome is saying to heart and apply it here in America. Well, I think, you know, I was reading some of the news coverage of his election and um, the National Catholic Reporter described him as decent, pastoral, and genuine. Um, and uh, David Gibson at the Religion News Service, who covers this stuff, uh, wrote about um, how he has 
had this focus on helping the poor and vulnerable, but he's also has been engaged in these political issues. He's protested outside abortion clinics. Um, he's had things to say about the contraception coverage. Um, I can't remember if the um, Archdiocese of Louisville is one of the dioceses that sued HHS um, over it. Uh, but um, and has spoken out against same sex marriage. So like you're saying, he's he's striking this balance of keeping, you know, he's not somebody who and not that there I don't think that there really were very many bishops in the bishops conference who who have uh, shied away from or um, backed away from the church's uh, or the bishops conference position on those uh, those particular issues, the the contraception coverage issue being a sort of quintessentially American issue. Um, so it sort of seems like, yeah, he's, he's kind of the, the sort of guy that they've been, you know, that, that sort of seems to fit this mold that he's, he hasn't shied away from those issues. He's not afraid to, he won't be afraid to stick with them. And he's seen as his community as somebody who has, been pastoral, except I guess by some of the sex abuse victims who, who told uh, Gibson that he hasn't he hasn't done much to reach out to them. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, it seems to me that there's you know pretty stable consensus among you know the American bishops, and uh, I, I wonder to you know, to what extent are we missing you know the challenges that you know that they'll be facing, you know some of the um, you know if. So if we can say that the American bishops are, you know, there there are differences you have, um, you know, among them, but I think the differences are narrower now than they maybe have been in the recent mm -hmm. past. And so what, you know, kind of what distinguishes the approaches of different bishops? Uh, and, and one thing I'm interested in is seeing how, you know, bishops just sort of run, you know, their dioceses and, um, you know, the church faces these huge challenge, you know, huge challenges of being, especially in the Northeast, it has these uh, kind of crumbling institutions. Uh, you know, often crumbling in terms of infrastructure, or crumbling in terms of what? Right. Well, in terms of, you know, there's there are big buildings that you know, need repairs, mm -hmm. you know, schools that are underfunded, right. uh, staff that are underpaid, you know, pensions that are, you know underfunded. And so, you know, how can the church respond to these challenges? And, you know, I've been interested to see some of the uh, approaches taken by uh, Archbishop Shapiro in Philadelphia. He's been you know, kind of exploring these uh, partnerships with, uh, you know, charter schools to try to save as many Catholic schools as he can. You know, he sold off the Episcopal residence, uh, you know, the Bishop's Mansion in Philadelphia, and, is and this he's sort of, sorry, go ahead. I mean, is this a result of payouts to sex abuse victims or uh, fewer mass attending Catholics putting money in the collection plate? What's the cause of these financial problems? Yeah, well, in, in Philadelphia, uh, certainly you have, um, you know, an issue of, you know, Catholic families are smaller, so there's you know, less need for maybe four schools. And so to some extent, schools have to close. New schools have opened in the suburbs where Catholics have moved and there are fewer in the mm -hmm. inner city. So there are even kind of just demographic shifts mm -hmm. that affect this. But yeah, uh, you know, certainly across the country, you know, payouts to sex abuse victims um, you know, has, has, uh, has been a huge drain on resources. And then also just you know, in terms of credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to the church asking people for money, they say, well, is this just going to go to pay off your right. uh, pay off victims for right, right. You know, your negligence? So um, so you were talking about Chaput in particular mm -hmm. um, trying to make these changes. And is this something that you think is going to, I mean, is this going to become a trend or is this something that's been sort of particular to Philadelphia and its demographics? Yeah, I think it, well, I think it will uh, be explored elsewhere. I mean, Chaput has always been, one of the more entrepreneurial bishops, um, you know, kind of bringing focus, the fellowship of Catholic university students into Denver when he was there. He was, he was brought into Denver to kind of clean up the messy situation that had been there. And um, anyway, what, what you see 
with this sort of a kind of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit like Chaput's, you know, he's a he's a Capuchin, um, and so he's a priest in a religious order uh, that has always been dedicated to reform and renewal, and has always stood a little bit apart from the church's uh, other institutions. And so, um, you know, I think Francis, uh, you know, partakes of this as well. You know, he comes from an order. He's more willing to shake things up, to try something new. And uh, in, a lot, in a lot of ways, the church does need, um, you know, in terms of like its institutional governance, like the willingness to look at some fresh solutions. So I see, you know, Francis's kind of uh, unorthodoxy there is potentially very helpful. You know, the thing about experimenting with new solutions is that not everything will stick and some things could be, you know, distractions or, you know, wastes of uh, time and resources. Well, it sounds like, you know, he's at once saying, you know, don't be so focused on these political issues. It's not like you have to change your mind on them, but don't be so focused on them. Focus more on pastoral care and also be a better bureaucrat in a way, right? Right. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think he's, so he's trying to, yeah, to be a better bureaucrat, but be a better one, <laughs> be, be a better kind of governor of the church by being a little bit less of a, of a bureaucrat. He's trying to, okay. uh, or better you know, manager, consult. maybe, I don't know. Right, right. What the right word is, right? He, yeah, he's trying to consult yeah. more. He has this group of eight, these bishops who, you know, are going to propose like a, you know, you know, maybe a reform of the curia, mm-hmm. um, or, or kind of just be a, his consulting body. And uh, and then also, I think it's I think it's it's interesting. I, I think that this isn't. Um, I don't. I, I myself don't find this totally helpful. But uh, but I think the massive reaction suggests that other most people feel differently. You know, the, the way that he's spoken, that Francis has spoken, is so unscripted, spontaneous that mm-hmm. often people are scrambling to say, "Well, he didn't. He didn't mean this. He really, really, he meant this." And so, if he were a politician, this would mean he were that he was extremely gaff prone right. and 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 not not an not an effective communicator so he's not uh but but the truth is his communication has been extremely effective in showing the church's love to people and so he he wants i think um or in fact we know his uh his press secretary has said as much that francis has made a conscious decision to speak to the world in a less scripted manner yeah he 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 wants to kind of he wants to sit down and chat with us, kind of shoot the breeze. And I think that's why he's had such a positive reaction from yeah. from non-Catholics too. Right, because what the first thing that shows is kind of solidarity. If you um, if you sort of sit down and speak with someone uh, in a way that's sort of uh, you know, spontaneous, you know, reactive, you know, to what they're saying where you're willing to like risk a sort of a certain infelicity or imprecision, you know, that shows solidarity and trust between you and that person. Whereas, you know, in contexts of sort of, uh, you know, more formal contexts where there's like less trust, less camaraderie, and then people speak in a more you know, scripted way. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> so people, Francis is kind of showing the world that he, he loves the world and he, he views it, you know, as, he views all men as his brothers and, you know, as his children. And uh, so that that's the huge upside to this um, less scripted way in which he's been speaking. You know, the downside is that, you know, as I told you once when we, t- when we talked uh, last, that, you know, certain, I think, false hopes are raised about mm-hmm. uh, changes in the church's teaching. Right. And if you if you disagree with the church, uh, the church's teaching on, on gay rights or, or on abortion uh, and... Uh, certain comments of Pope Francis, you know, have raised, you know, one's hopes, you know, I I think those hopes are going to be disappointed. Right. And I think that uh, in a way, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but I think that the, the Cardinal's choice of Francis was very clever or smart for them, because I think that he has succeeded in changing the public perception of the church changing the perception of many people that all the church cares about is um, stopping same-sex marriage and stopping abortion and and stopping the contraception mandate. I mean, so I think that it was a very smart 
PR move. I don't know if that was it was intended that way, that way or not. Mm-hmm. But uh, so he has succeeded in doing that without actually undermining the church's teaching on it. Uh, so it's kind of the best of both worlds from the church's perspective, I would think. Do you think that this is a honeymoon? You know, I have been amazed by the uh, a lot of the liberal reaction to Francis. And because I think it's hard to dislike him. Uh, I think that Benedict, for example, had a very different public persona and public image and the public's perception of him. I mean, I think that it was hard for him to get past the Rottweiler reputation. And because um, as some uh, people have pointed, I mean, I I think it's hard for non-Catholics to understand this, but I think that there are uh, conservative Catholics who believe that Francis is just a, you know, on a continuum with Benedict and he's continuing the same on the same course as Benedict was on. I think that's very, uh, that's a very hard seamless transition for non-Catholics to see. I think that people saw Francis, uh, saw Benedict as this conservative enforcer of, you know, the doctrine of the faith and, you know, appointing these very conservative um, bishops, uh, especially here in the United States, where you know, Americans, you know, see the, the role of the church as, the role of the bishops conference as being very, very politicized. Um, so I think because of the different way that those, the two popes have of communicating with the public, um, I think that it has just completely changed the perception of the Pope and they, that, that Francis has perceived as this really awesome guy. I mean, I think that that's how people see him. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the guy who, you know, there was that, um, that video with the, with the child a couple weeks ago and just his whole way of interacting with people is very, um, accessible and he's not holed up in the Vatican. He's out there with people and saying these very likable things. Yeah. I, I call Francis the honey badger Pope. <laughs> you know, he's willing to, uh, he's willing to do anything to kind of get, get the gospel across and you never know what he'll do. He's, he's spontaneous. He's, you know, he's like, I'm going to go, I'll, uh, exercise a demon from a man, you know, I'll, um, you know, pat this child on the head and put him on, my throne, uh, you know, <laughs> right. I'll, you know, I'll go out and kiss this man. I'll, I'll sort of shoot from the hip in an interview. I mean, he's, you know, I'll pay my hotel bill. I, I'm going to live in a different residence. It's clear that he wants, he wants to shake things up. He wants to, um, you know, tear down. He feels that formality kind of stands between him and, and the Christian people, uh, you know, to, to some degree and, and to the rest of the world. And so he's, He's the honey badger. He's going to do. He's going to do whatever he wants, whatever it takes to get, you know, get the gospel message across. Well, I mean, I think you know, not that Twitter is the gauge of public opinion, but you know, you can see how he he's probably, you know, I, somebody wrote an article about the number of times his his tweets are retweeted and that sort of thing. He's like very popular in social media, but you know, you see this reaction from people. Um, when something comes out, like the video of the kid sitting on the throne and all of that. And, you know, it's like he's got this Midas touch with the with the um, public persona. Everybody just kind of goes crazy over it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really want to hang out with him. And I think that I feel that that's how I would put it. Sons of I want to have an audience with the Pope. You know, I, I, I want to hang out with them, and I feel like okay. Everyone, well, here it was said. It was way. it was said on Blogging Heads. Surely Pope Francis watches this, and he'll <laughs> give you an audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Thanks so much for talking about all of this. It was really interesting and fun. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye.